Hello, everyone. I'm hoping that the tech hasn't failed me uh, and I'm online. I think one of my colleagues is going to um, confirm that in a second. Um, we are live, I hope, both on Facebook Live and on Instagram. Uh, and we'll get started as soon as I know that this is working. Fantastic. So I think we are good to go. Um, so thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, my name is Tama Chowdhury. I'm one of the trustees of the King's Head Theatre. Um, as you know, the King's Head um, is a charity and whilst um, the theatre is determined to make the best plays and opera um, and creative arts that you can see anywhere uh, off West End, um, you know, one of the biggest challenges that we have is that we need to continue running um, fundraising, keep the doors open and that's obviously a particular challenge now but we're not going to focus on the doom and gloom we're going to focus on what we can do um, to improve ourselves and to improve this industry um, over the next um, few months whilst we are um, isolated and, and whilst the theatre's doors are closed. So just a little bit about myself I'm going to speak for about um, five ten minutes um, just sort of giving you a background about what I do and um, some thoughts that I've had on access in the arts and access more generally. Um, and then uh, obviously any questions that you have throughout, please comment um, below on Facebook and on Instagram. And I will try and answer as many of them as I can um, uh, over the next half an hour. Um, so I joined the King's Head uh, Trustee Board about two years ago. And um, before that, um, I had produced a couple of shows at the King's Head. I don't produce theatre. Uh, anymore, but I produced two shows at King's Head, a few other um, shows in some other office end venues and also Royal Festival Hall. Um, I've written before as well, but I guess my background predominantly lies in charity. And as I said, when I started, the King's Head is a charity. Um, and uh, most recently, I um, was very lucky to be named um, on the Forbes Under 30 list for some of that charity work that I've done. And I'm really determined to try and give back as much as I can to the King's Head because um, it is a very special um, place. It's an amazing place to work. It's an amazing place um, to be a part of. But that fortune, I think, to be a part of something like the King's Head doesn't exist for everyone. Um, and in particular, I'll say for, for people from certain backgrounds. Um, and what I mean by that is where you were born, where you were brought up, how you identify, all, all manner of things that shouldn't matter. Um, ultimately still do across a lot of different walks of life. And whilst that's really difficult to change, um, I think there's a belief in the theatre that we can, um, you know, rise up to those sorts of challenges if we work together. And I have no doubt that over the coming months and years, we'll be able to rise uh, to the challenge that's in front of us right now, but also to this challenge of access in the arts. Now, I'm sure many of you would have seen uh, Joaquin Phoenix's um, acceptance speeches when he won Best Actor at BAFTAs, um, at the Oscars as well. He was really touching on what I think is the most important point about access, which is for those who have managed to make it or are in the process of making it, um, there's an onus on, on everyone that is in that position of privilege to be able to support those that haven't had those opportunities. Um, the art and you know i i would say in particular with theater um ethnic minorities for example are massively underrepresented um women still don't get the same um opportunities that men do lgbt um and people who identify as transgender and, and other things also don't get those opportunities and that's something that the king's head has been at the forefront of challenging for, for many many years um, and continues to do so. And I think accessibility goes beyond just having an equal number of women in shows or goes beyond giving certain people an opportunity. It goes to a much more sort of systematic heart, um, which is that the more we can do to sort of enable a culture, not just for what we're producing in the King's Head, but across theatres in London and across the world, the more that that will become the norm. Um, at King's Head, we're doing that in quite a few ways. We've got a creative access scheme uh, where we support um, individuals and we train individuals from uh, underrepresented backgrounds. 
uh, in our shows, uh, we make sure that everyone is fairly paid, which is one of the biggest barriers to entry um, in the theatre, as many of you will know. Um, but there's so much more that we can do. And for those who are actors or those who are aspiring to be actors or stage managers or producers or directors or whatever it is, or, or trustees like I am, um, there is a responsibility to remember as you're trying to make it, whatever your background, um, that there are those who support you and there are those who will um, continue to have your back. And in return, we all have a responsibility to do the same. Um, that's pretty much all that I'm going to say about me and my thoughts, because I'm quite interested to hear what all of you have to say and all of you have to think. Um, so please do start commenting um, on Facebook and on Instagram. If you have any questions, um, share your thoughts. I'll be reading them out as they come through. Um, so we can get the conversation started because it's very much Q&A rather than just me lecturing on why I think access is important. Um, while people are uh, figuring out what they want to say and contribute, I'll, I'll turn to that as soon as we start seeing some comments coming through. I guess we know that, and we recognize that the arts aren't, um, aren't the only area that's affected. And one of the other charities that I'm on the board of um, is called the Access Project, which supports disadvantaged and underprivileged um, school children to get uh, into the best universities or the best apprenticeships possible when they um, finish their GCSEs or they finish their A-levels. Um, and what we see in the Access Project, what we see in the King's Head and, and across so many different walks of society, whether that's the arts or education, um, et cetera, I think it's that that gap is probably going to be, is, it probably widens in times of crisis. Um, and at the moment, that's something that we're seeing and that's something that a lot of access charities and organizations are concerned about. Um, and so now more than ever is the time when we need to be really conscious about that and start doing as much as we can to support those who otherwise might not be represented. I see a couple of questions coming through, so I'll um, jump onto those. So Alex Jackson's asked, um, have you got any thoughts about the differences between the challenges faced by London venues and regional venues? I think there's challenges on two fronts here. One is that the reality is that a lot of diversity on in terms of ethnic diversity um, exists in London that doesn't exist in other parts of the country. Um, so regional venues will naturally have um, a, a particular challenge when recruiting um, ethnically diverse talent. That obviously doesn't apply um, for socioeconomic backgrounds, LGBT, um, etc. Um, but I think regional venues probably do have more of a challenge. They also have more of a funding challenge, which makes it more difficult to do things perhaps like um, paying people a fair wage, etc. But I think the amazing thing about the arts is this ability to respond um, regardless of how big the challenge is. You know, when before I uh, was a trustee of the King's Head Theatre, um, I was a producer for a small off West End theatre company. And we made the decision before we even founded. Um, and, you know, at the time we were only, you know, 19, 20 years old. Um, to pay all of our actors, which was rare and is still rare, unfortunately, um, on the fringe. And that was a massive undertaking. But if you commit to having certain values and you, and you commit to doing things a particular way and you work with people who have those same values and share those same values or um, want the same outcomes as you, then I think you can do it. So naturally, I think there is more of a challenge for regional venues uh, in light of that. But um, that's not to say that they can't uh, they can't rise up to them. A uh, question from Fiona English on Facebook: Large organisations, small organisations, the Arts Council, who can have the biggest impact uh, in transforming diversity in our industry? I think it's definitely a collective effort. I think um, large organisations, in particular, have have more of a responsibility, and I think that's true for any uh, sector and any industry. That those who have the deepest pockets and those that have um, had the most opportunities and can give the most opportunities um, should be giving back as much as they can. Um, but there's no onus on them to do that unless it's a sector-wide approach uh, and, you know, again, a shared value um, that we have to, to sort of really believing that diversity is important. Um, so for small organisations, you know, the King's Head is, is a relatively um, small theatre that punches far above its weight, if I say so myself. Um, but other theatres like the King's Head um, do have a responsibility to, to promote diversity and to transform diversity because so many 
of the big changes that we see in society start at the grassroots and start um, in communities. And I think that's where smaller venues have, have a big responsibility alongside larger organisations and larger theatres. Um, in terms of the Arts Council and other sort of public bodies, um, the government as well, there is a massive responsibility there. And I think in the Arts Council's case, it's to really champion diversity by putting the funds where they should go to be able to enrich um, the theatre as much as they can. And, and that's really the point, because what we're not saying is access for access's sake or diversity for diversity's sake. Uh, I, don't, I don't think anybody thinks that or, or believes in that. I think it's understanding that we are so much stronger when we do support people to get access, whether they're from ethnically diverse backgrounds or socioeconomically deprived backgrounds or LGBT backgrounds or whatever it might be. Um, the theatre that we create, um, the art that we create or whatever sector it is, is so much better as a result of us being able um, to, to provide those opportunities. And that's where the Arts Council and the government um, in particular have, have a big responsibility in sort of diverting resources to be able to enable large and small organisations to see the value um, and have a, see the sustainable value um, in championing diversity. Um, can you talk about some examples of best practices in the industry, schemes, ideas and approaches that have worked well for others? Um, yeah, so I think creative access is, is probably the first one that I'll talk about because it's something that, that we're doing at the King's Head Theatre. Um, what's really important when you're developing a scheme or you're taking part of in the scheme, I think, is, again, not to just do it for the sake of doing it. And that's where um, opportunities like creative access um, are so important because you're able to really put expertise in a sustainable way um, before people, you know, we're, cu we're currently in a crisis right now, you know, with the current co uh, coronavirus pandemic. It would be so easy um, for a theatre like the King's Head or for other venues who are um, doing great work in um, normal times to drop that great work that they're doing in terms of access, whether that's uh, training or whether that's um, access programs or whatever it might be. Now is the time more than ever to be uh, investing in those and promoting those. Um, I think the ones that have been able to continue and the ones that will be able to continue moving forward are those where that access and that um, approach is embedded into what the actual organization needs. There's no point in investing in a trainee director program if that program isn't valuable to the organization that's investing in it. Um, there, there's no point in doing things for the sake of doing them. But that's the point, because when you are talking about diversity, when we're talking about access, it's mutually beneficial both for the people that we're supporting and the people that we're trying to reach, but also for the organizations themselves. Um, and the schemes that are working best and the ideas and approaches that are working best are those that really recognize that. Um, any other questions? I um, can carry on talking for as long as I want. <laughs> uh, I can see that a few people are, are thinking about what they want to say. So just as a reminder for those that are joining in, because we've got a few people who are um, coming in now, uh, we're talking about access in the theatre, um, and in particular how we can promote um, diversity in our industry. Um, diversity of thought, diversity of inclusion, whether that's um, promoting the equal status of women in the theatre, uh, in all in all parts of the theatre as well. That's something that I don't think we've touched upon yet. Um, it's all well and good to say that actors and actresses should be uh, paid the same on stage, which is absolutely true. You know, equal pay for equal work and all that, all of that. But it goes far beyond just what we see on stage. It's also about what we see on the box office, and it's what we see. Um, in theatre management, it's what we see uh, in the sort of production management side of things. And we need to be aware that diversity, whether that's um, sex or LGBT or um, socioeconomic backgrounds or whatever it is, recognises that we need to be accessible as an industry to people, uh, regardless of their background, in every part of our industry. Um, and that, you know, that comes down to the board as well. I'm really proud that the King's Head um, Theatre's Board of Trustees 
um, is a majority women. We've got um, people from every single uh, background that you can think of. Um, and likewise, other charities that I'm involved in, at my own charity, we really value diversity on our board because it's that diversity of thought that really does make a massive difference to what we're able to um, achieve in the best interest of the people that we are serving. In the King's Heads case, that's our audiences, uh, as well as the artists um, and, and staff that work with us. Um, and so at every level, in every sort of role, I think we need to be championing um, that diversity and that accessibility. Um, any questions, we're on Facebook Live and we're on Instagram Live as well. Um, I can see there are plenty of people who are just watching quietly. <laughs> so if you do want to ask any questions, then please fire them away. Um, I think we can, uh, while we're waiting for a couple of other um, comments and questions to come through, going back to the owner's question from earlier about the responsibility of um, where transforming diversity comes in terms of who can have the biggest impact. Um, I was saying that I think that everyone has to have an impact and everyone collectively um, will have the most significant impact. But touching on what small organizations can do, we sort of spoke about it from the organization point of view, but I think artists and those who are performing or producing in these venues also have a responsibility and also have a role to play. Um, you know, at the King's Head, we are very fortunate to work with some incredible um, visiting companies, some incredible um, actors and stage managers and directors who come through our doors um, as freelancers or as visiting companies. And all of you have an incredibly important role to play in championing that diversity, because what is really vital is that those theatres, whether that's King's Head or anywhere else that you're performing or working in, um, have the understanding that this is a value that you share as well. And that's where we're really going to be able to drive change um, across our industry. And um, there's a couple more questions that have come through. Um, Charlotte has asked, uh, beyond diverse programming, how do we develop diverse audiences? Um, that's a fantastic question. And I think it's a challenge that we have always had um, in, um, in the arts. Uh, when I first got going to the theatre um, in my early teens, um, and I fell in love with it, um, I was probably the only under 25 in a lot of audiences. I was probably the only brown person in a lot of audiences. Um, we, have, we have a problem, and I don't think that's a problem that is as extreme as it was um, back then. I think we've, we've taken great strides forward over the last 10, 10 or so years, um, but it is something that we need to be very conscious of. In terms of how we can do it, I think, firstly, in developing younger uh, and um, more diverse um, audiences for, in terms of socioeconomic background, is making theatre accessible financially. Um, there are so many theatres in London producing such fantastic work that is just out of the financial reach of so many people. And it's all well and good having an occasional scratch night or an occasional night where you can um, do these um, you know, pay what you like or, or have discounted tickets. I think we need as an industry, um, and this is where organisations like the Arts Council and the government have a lot of responsibility to support smaller organisations doing this, um, but we need to be championing um, that sort of access much more regularly um, and allowing people to also have the freedom to be able to, you know, part of the beauty of the theatre is being able to do it at your own pace and be able to understand it in a way that that um, you can appreciate and is personal to you. And that is why, you know, having 30 shows, but only one where someone can pay what they like or only one where someone can attend um, if they don't, uh, if they can't afford um, normal price tickets, for example. That's why we need to be able to support those individuals in coming whenever they can so that they can understand the beauty and the benefit of the theatre. Um, separate to that, I think, is also um, championing diversity on stage um, and those involved in the, in the theatre behind the stage as well, um, because people will come and see, if they are from um, underrepresented backgrounds, um, diversity on stage. And I think that's really important for being able to get um, different audiences um, coming along and engaging in the theatre. And there are a few other questions. I have a few more thoughts on that. So I might um, write something up afterwards. But there are a few other questions that have come through. 
Um, on Facebook, um, Barbie has asked, uh, what's your thinking, Ari, what happens in schools to offer up industry as an option to all children? I think we need to do uh, more on arts education to make it more diverse. Actually, this goes partly to Charlotte's question as well, because I think there's a lot more that we can be doing in schools and schools should be doing to champion, uh, to champion the arts. Um, I went to school in Islington and our um, theatre and creative arts programme was outstanding. I was incredibly lucky uh, and that's really where my love for the theatre started. Um, but it was always, and, and they'll hopefully forgive me for saying this, it, it was always at the time um, a hobby. Um, really for, for people and that's how it was encouraged you know this is going to help you boost your self-confidence and this is um, something that you can do in your spare time etc all incredibly important vital things to champion but as a career I wouldn't say that they ever encouraged that sort of uh, for people to engage with the arts with that in mind um, schools can do a lot more in terms of taking people to the theatre uh, taking the and and starting from a much younger age as well you know a lot of um, theatre trips and arts trips only happen once you choose um, which subjects you're going to be studying for GCSE. So starting um, in primary school and, and early secondary school so that people can really start to fall in love with the theatre um, early on in their life. Um, but also in terms of career guidance and support, you know, really encouraging people to follow their ambitions and to follow their dreams. I think there are probably you know, hundreds and thousands of, of young people across the country who dream of performing in the theatre uh, professionally and doing that for their life. Um, what we really want to be able to achieve as an industry, I think, is for schools to recognise that theatre is, an, uh, is a um, medium that their pupils can access and that is valuable to them. And to do that, we need to be doing a lot more as organisations ourselves in terms of reaching out to schools and reaching out to young people so that they can see that there is a future for them um, in the arts. And there's a couple of more questions. How do we reach people who already don't think that theatre is for them? Um, people, people could change their minds if you, if you convince them and you're convincing enough, then they will change their minds. I think... Um, it's it's really easy to say that okay well that's some that's someone who's never enjoyed the theater or that's someone who's never enjoyed the opera um so you know this just isn't for them um i hated the opera until maybe three or four years ago um and it was actually watching the opera at the king's head that made me <laughs> fall in love with opera um people will change their minds i guess you just need to produce shows that convince them obviously there's a challenge in the question which is how do we reach those people to encourage them to come and watch a show i think this again goes down to um making the theater an open and accessible place for everyone a, a, a space where people feel comfortable that they can try new things and that's not just about the artists and those involved in creating productions but also those who are attending and, and the audiences because by encouraging people to sort of see the theatre as a space where they can try new things and learn things about themselves, um, that's how we're going to encourage them to come and see shows that they might fall in love with. And also, I guess, diverse programming um, fits into that. And that means, you know, King's Head audiences, I'm sure, not everyone loves the opera that we do, and not everyone loves the LGBT work that we do, and not everyone loves the revivals that we do. But there's something for everyone. And in London, we're so fortunate with the incredible talent and the incredible diversity of um, of shows that we can see. I think it's just a case of really representing the culture that we already have in the theatre, which is this is an open space where people can learn and people can um, be creative, everyone, um, and really helping those who aren't familiar with the theatre to understand that um, and recognise that. Um, another question is, other than Arts Council, which organisations are doing good work measuring and tracking diversity, uh, tracking sector diversity? Um, to be honest, that's a question that I'm not 100% sure of. I think um, ACE are doing a fantastic job. I think individual um, theatres are doing good jobs. Um, the Old Vic is it's something that um, since Matthew Walker came in um, is... Um, is doing a good job on that and I think individual organizations are doing that. I don't think 
and maybe this is the other way of looking at it uh, in response to your question. I think the government can be doing more to encourage that sort of diversity. And as a question that came up earlier um, in terms of regional versus London, um, that's a really key point because it's all well and good encouraging diversity in London, um, but we need to be encouraging diversity across the country. And that's something that the government and Arts Council um, can both be doing more of to encourage on a regional level that that sort of uh, measurement and evaluation work so that we can constantly, you know, it's not good enough to say, for example, that the King's Head has more women on its board than it has men or it has um, other forms of diversity on our board or on stage uh, or in the office. Um, it's not good enough to just rely on that track record, however proud we might be of it. We need to build on that work and we need to constantly be evaluating how well we're doing and how well we're achieving that. And so whilst I don't know about which organisations are already doing that, really well. I can say that there are plenty of organizations that are, but the real challenge is making sure that all organizations recognize the importance of it um, and can keep going and are encouraged um, to keep doing more. Um, other questions? I'm just trying to make sure that I have everything as they're coming through. Oh, there are some more on Facebook that I uh, miss. At the moment, affirmative action is effective with schemes like Creative Access. But how, when, and how do we reach a place where accessibility is given, is a given, and not as much of a conscious effort? Um, just trying to get my head around that question. Uh, it's effective with schemes like creative access, but how, when, how do we reach a place when accessibility is given, not so much of a conscious effort? Okay, so I think what this is, what this is coming at is there are organisations like the King's Head who are really trying to do all they can and and you know the king's head isn't alone in this there are lots of organizations across the country who are doing all they can to champion diversity um, and accessibility but they are making a conscious effort to do that and i guess the question is when organizations aren't making a conscious effort because accessibility is a given um what how how do we get to that point where con that sort of conscious effort is getting at i think that's the question and and forgive me if it's not i think it goes slightly back to the last question, which is how do we monitor and track and evaluate how we're doing? And I think there's a risk if we, obviously the aim is to get to a place where our theatres, both in terms of what's happening on stage, um, in the office, backstage, and in our audiences, is diverse enough that we don't have to make a conscious effort. But I think we will always need to make a conscious effort, not because we can't achieve that diversity um, and that accessibility, but because we need to not fall into the trap of thinking that we're safe if we do achieve that. And so I think the more that we can make a conscious effort to promote diversity in our workplaces, in our theatres, in our audiences, et cetera, um, the more that we can do um, to make sure that we can reach a place where diversity and inclusion is a given um, and not something that we need to constantly strive towards. Um, final question just before we log off then. Um, do you think that the present pandemic presents an opportunity for theatres in regard to expanding their audiences and championing diversity on and off stage? Absolutely. Um, you know, I know that people are sat at home at the moment, as I am, thinking, you know, how, how are we going to get through this? You know, at times, thinking, how, how are we going to get through this? How, as an industry, as an individual, as a family, whatever it is, um, are we going to get through this? But I think it's a great opportunity for reflection. Um, and yes absolutely theatres should be reaching new audiences in this time and um, we're, we're having to reevaluate how we do meetings how we interact with colleagues how we interact with family etc how we interact with our neighbours and at shops um, and so naturally theatres should be thinking about how we can interact with our audiences and I think all theatres and all, all organisations have a responsibility um, in using this time um, to really champion those values and to really reflect and think about what those values are that they want to be championing um, and make sure that they can um, make the best of the opportunities that they have. Um, that's all for the questions that I'm going to take. Um, just a reminder that KHD online sessions are uh, every weekday 1 to 1.30 on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, the next session is tomorrow, which is an Ask Us Anything session. Um, it's been a real, real pleasure um, speaking to everyone uh, and doing this. If there are any other questions that um, that you have, please do ask them in the comments uh, and I will try to get back to you uh, as soon as possible. Uh, but thanks everyone. Take care, stay safe 
Um, and yeah, see you soon, hopefully. Take care.